Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Profitable Pastures 2024. I'm Birgit Martin. I'm the chair of the Ontario Forge Council this year, and I will be um, directing the session this evening. Um, uh, tonight, our, in fact, the entire conference, the three sessions last night, tonight, and tomorrow night are sponsored by Beef Farmers of Ontario and the Farm Resil Resilience Mentorship Program, short form FARM. Uh, so this evening's presenter is James Byrne. James Byrne is a beef cattle specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. James main area of focus includes improving cow calf production and management, improving management of backgrounded cattle on pasture and in confinement, cattle nutrition and performance from pasture. James writes regularly for virtual beef, Ontario beef, and Ontario cattle feeders. James is involved with the annual planning beef symposium, ruminant feed industry days, and grazing cover crop work workshops. James joined the ministry in 2017 and is based out of the Lindsay office. Welcome James, and I will let you introduce your um, topic this evening and let you have the floor. So uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, estimating cattle performance from pasture. So um, when I look at pasture or when I go onto a pasture, um, I'm, I view pastures essentially from the animal's perspective. So I look at when I walk onto a pasture, my first kind of thought is to look at the pasture itself, see what kind of condition it's in, and then take a look at the animals and to see, okay, could I kind of guess and look at these individual animals and say, how quickly are they actually growing? You know, the cattle here in this picture that, that, that we have, you look at these animals, you look at the pasture and you kind of try to estimate what, what is the likely performance from this, from this pasture? So my, my take on pasture has always been to take it from the animals, from the animal's perspective, because ultimately it's the animal that's going to, uh, going to give you the return because they're the animals that's going to be, that you're going to go along and to be, and to be selling. So, I'm going to talk about tonight, we're going to use terms like modeling and and I really do use the word estimate rather than, and I think in the in the initial kind of discussions we had about this particular, when Christina, Christina, Christina and I chatted about this particular presentation, I used the word predict, but I said, you know, the word predict is slightly, uh, we use the word predict when we talk about the weather for, forecast, but I prefer the word estimate because it, it kind of means that it allows a little bit more flexibility. What we are doing is, we're trying to estimate from a visual observation, what is our likely performance that we could be getting from our pasture at any one given time. And if we keep that, uh, if we can record that, then we'd have an idea of how our animals have performed over the, over, the, over the year. So the question then becomes, why do we want to estimate our model performance from our, from our pasture? Well, ultimately we want to go along and to determine what is that performance? So I know people here on the, on our, um, uh, on our webinar tonight. A lot of people are going to be on the beef side, uh, but we do have people on the sheep side and we have people on the, the dairy side as well to organic and grass fed as well. So when I use performance, I really mean performance in its broadest sense. So for these uh, cattle that we see here that have been backgrounded, we're talking about their weight gain, but we may be also be talking about performance. When we mean performance on the cow calf side, it could be maintaining the cow's uh, body condition, making sure she's milking well, making sure she's going back in calf. And on the dairy side, we could be talking about making sure she's milking well. And on the sheep side, the same thing. We have sheep or lambs out on, on pasture that they're actually gaining. So it's pasture in the performance. When you hear me mention the word performance, think about it from your own perspective. The other thing I do want to say is throughout the night, throughout this webinar, I'm going to be at this presentation, I'm going to be showing you a whole pile of pictures. So I want you to go along and just to think about those particular, put yourself into the mind of the animal. So if you are this animal on this particular pasture, what would your performance likely be? And think about your own farm and think about different times of the year as to how your animals would be performing as your pasture changes over the grazing season. So the question becomes then, why do we want to estimate or model our performance from pasture? And really we want to do is we want to determine that particular performance. 
performance on a pasture is not like animals in confinement. It's not really practical, really, on most farms. And I use these animals here in, 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 as, as an example to go along and weigh these animals regularly. It's just not, you can do it. There is technology that would allow you to do it, but it's not a very practical scenario in most farms. So we're going to talk about this idea of modeling. So modeling just simply means taking a data, a bunch of data, and looking at a bunch of research and saying, this is what the research says, this is what the data is, putting the data and the research together and coming up with an end result. And then comparing that end result to the real world. So getting real world information and saying, how does the real world compare to what we think the world is kind of like? So it's a bit like baking a cake and getting all the ingredients, but not being told how those ingredients have been put together. Baking that cake based on our best, our best information and then going to the uh, somebody and saying, here, try this cake and see what do you think it's like? So it's that kind of relationship there. So we can model because we want to know, we, we can look at uh, what the end performance is likely to be based on our previous year's experience. So we can think back uh, and we'll show you when I go through this exactly what this kind of looks like. What are animals likely did? The other thing we can do is that if we use modeling, we can look at this and say, Okay, I'm a, I am, my animals grew when we take just the, the I mean, use, and I use backgrounding animals a lot and stalkers on grass because it's the, in a sense, it's the easiest one to go along and talk about because we're talking about weight gain. And it allows us to then determine and look and think and work out what time during the grazing season did I make the greatest gain? So my animals may have gained one and a half pounds per head per day if I graze them from mid-May to mid-October, but it, it would be nice to know when did they make most of those gains? And can I look at the information that I gathered over the year um, as to when they went along and made those, when they most likely made those particular gains? And what that then allows you to do is to think about how can I adjust my grazing program to improve my cattle performance, my animal performance, whatever it is you're actually looking at. So if you walk into a pasture, you can say to yourself, okay, this is what it is like now. What is it, when, when I put my animals into this pasture, what are, what are they likely to do? And therefore then you can make decisions as to whether you graze it or what is that. So it allows you to make adjustments then to your cattle, to your cattle performance, because you're viewing it from the animal's perspective and it'll make more sense as we go through this. So I have here a picture of a bale of hay. So you might be thinking, why do I have a bale of hay for a, for a, a presentation on uh, grazing animals. And the reason why I put up this bale of hay is because I want you to think about your winter feeding system, your winter feeding program kind of provides you with some information that you can use when you're thinking about your pasture. So you have a bale of hay like this. If you walked up to this bale of hay, it's really difficult for you to tell by simply looking at it what or how well is this bale of hay going to, how much performance is this bale of hay going to give to my animals? So in order to get around that problem, we'll do all on and we'll take a forage test. So you'll do something like this. And this is just a, a forage test I got for a, a barley oats and pea alfalfa silage. So you'll send it off to the lab. You won't take one bale, you'll take a sample of bales. You'll hope your sample is reasonably representative of what you're feeding. And from the lab, you will get back your forage test result, and it will tell you what's in that bale of hay or in your bales of hay. So it'll give you results like your dry matter. You look at the protein levels, and, and this one at 17%, pretty small if trend for some people to go along and read this. You can look at what your fiber levels are. I think the key ones here really are your dry matter, your protein levels. You might take a look at your uh, NDF240 just to see what that's at. And the other one then really you look at here is your energy levels here. So we see here that the energy, the energy for maintenance in this case is 1.33 megacals per kg and for gain it's 0 0.75. So this is actually not a bad feed. Um, but this on its own doesn't really go along and tell you a whole lot. So what you have to do then is take that result then and put it into some kind of uh, ration balancing program. Either you do that yourself or you hand the information over to your nutritionist who will put that information into a nutrition balancing program. So in this case here, we've just got our cow, by, our, our cow bites uh, program that we have here. And one of the wonderful things about doing things using uh, balancing programs, and you can do this in on an, an Excel sheet as well, but it's just nice to use a program. It's just easier and much quicker. Um, it will give you a predicted average daily gain. 
Now, in this case, it's saying the predicted average gain in this case is about two pounds per head per day. Now, the 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 value of that really only comes to play when you go along and you weigh your animals at the end of the feeding period and see, did they really go along and gain two pounds per head per head per day? But if you don't want to go, if you decide and you look at this and you say to yourself, well, uh, that's not really enough. I'd really like to go along and do something more. I can make all, uh, adjustments to my feeding program. So I might decide, well, I'd like to be going almost two and a quarter pounds per head per day. So again, you can go to your ration balancing program and you can put in, oh, I'm going to feed my uh, my um, alfalfa silage there, but I'm also going to add some grain corn and that's going to give me a little bit more energy. And therefore I'm going to uh, be able to estimate using the best information that I have and, and all of these forage analysis and we put stuff into nutrition balancing software, whether it's this nice simple program that we have here or more complicated ones that we use on the dairy side, it's only as good as the information that's given in. The ultimate arbiter of how good you, how good your feed is, is the animals that you're feeding. Your program that tells you how well they're doing is, as I say, just what either you or your nutritionist has put in. And if it's different, there's something wrong with the data that was put into the program. There's nothing wrong with the animal. The animal is always right. It's the program that can sometimes be actually wrong. But the reason why I bring this up here is that it allows us to predict, because we have a lot of information, because we have a lot of research that's been done in the past to tell us, if you've got all this type of feed, this is how it digests, this is the energy that it gives the animal, and therefore this is how fast this animal is going to grow, or how much milk the animal is going to produce, so on and so forth. So it becomes very predictable. So when we're feeding animals in confinement, we have to take into account certain factors. One is that our dry matter intake is predictable. We control how much dry matter they in the intake. We have to feed them a minimum amount, but we can feed them a, a, above that. And that really is related then to the dietary energy content and what performance we want. And the important thing about that is that it's controllable. But the key thing here is it's, <clears throat> sorry, it's predictable and it's controllable. The nutritional requirements for performance is known. We know this because the NRC has done years and years and years and years and years of research that we know exactly what the nutritional requirements for performance, whatever that performance is, that's actually known. The other really important thing, which really is different from the grazing scenario, is that the nutritional status of feed is stable from day to day. So if you take a sample of your hay, for example, or you take a sample of your corn silage, you know you're going to be feeding that corn silage, you're going to be feeding hay, and this is, let's say you had one cut. Let's just take a, a kind of a silly example, and you had one cut that you got all your, your winter supply of hay available. Well, in that case, then, you would do your, 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 your analysis, and your analysis in October, when you've done your analysis, will be valid, when you come to in, 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 the, in the month of April, because the nutritional status of that feed is stable. So every day you feed, you can predict what's going to go along to happen, which means that our dietary nutrient intake is basically constant and predictable, which therefore means that our performance outcomes can be predicted with reasonable confidence. And it's easy to adjust or correct for different performance outcomes. As I showed in that example there, if you look at it and you just feed the animals that particular silage, you are getting about two pounds per day. Maybe as a producer, you want two and a half or two and a quarter or three. Well, you just simply go to your uh, ration balancing software and you make an adjustment. Or if, for example, you discover that your animals aren't growing as well as you thought they were, or as well as the, uh, the, the balancing shop software was telling you, you can go, okay, well, I got a an, an error here. I put in the wrong weight of animal or so on. And that's why I got a wrong outcome. But what about in the case of grazing? So one of the things I want to do for you today, tonight is just, I want people to take a look at the pictures that they're seeing here. So this is the pasture that you have in early May, 2023. And so I want you to kind of think about it and we we'll give some, I'll give some examples as I go through tonight. If you put your animals onto this type of pasture, what would you expect your animals to grow at or what would there would be their performance? So as I say, this is early May, this is spring. So again, it's a question of, if I was on that and I walked onto this, 
what do you think about? Do you think about, do I have enough? And everything I say tonight is really based on the logic that you have enough. You always have enough pasture. And we're really looking here at quality side of the house. So then we have here a picture then of animals here on a pasture then in mid-July. And we're again saying, okay, if we're looking at these animals, how fast do we think these animals are growing based on the pasture that you see? Now, they've trampled a fair amount of this particular pasture, but this is July. What do you think they're growing or how fast do you think they're actually growing? So that's in July. Again, we'll come back to some of these pictures. So this is a regrowth of uh, pasture in July. Uh, again, this is intensely managed pasture. And I just, we, my, so my students shot this video. And I think, so again, we're asking the question, if you put your animals onto this particular type of pasture, what type of re, what type of performance would you actually expect? So when we think about cattle performance from grazing, and remember when we talked about confinement, the certain characteristics in the confinement situation, which do not apply when we talk about grazing. So when we're talking about grazing, we know that our dry matter intake is variable. It changes over time. And sometimes that can be difficult to predict what that's likely to be. And it's really important if you're trying to predict animal performance to know exactly how much they're actually eating. So when you think about those, particularly those first, those, those three pictures, it's very clear that those three pictures would have different intakes because they're very different, but they occur in the same year. So it's not as if, it's not your different, not a different field or anything like that. These are the same, it's the same field essentially, but it's in a different grazing state or a different uh, stage of growth. We know from the NRC that basically our nutritional requirements for performance, they're known because they don't go along and change because a cow is a cow is a cow. It doesn't matter where that cow is. It doesn't matter whether the cow is in Northern Ontario, Southwestern Ontario, Eastern Canada, Western Canada, it doesn't matter. The cow is the cow is the cow. So her nutrition requirements remain exactly the same. And we get this from the NRC tables. Because in addition to the dry matter intake of the animals being variable, the nutritional status of the pasture is not variable. So the energy content, its digestibility, uh, this changes from day to day. So pastures are dynamic. Always, every time, every day you go into a pasture, your pasture is different than the day before. And that's because it's always growing. And one of the things we always have to keep in mind when we think about pastures, and we think about the animals grazing that particular pasture, that they're faced with this fact that every single day they get up in the morning to graze or whatever time they want to start grazing at, they're grazing a different pasture to the one that they grazed the day before because the, gra the pasture they're on is a day older. And being a day older, it's different. This is not the same as when you're feeding animals hay. When you're feeding animals hay, the, the bale of hay that you fed on a Monday is the same type of bale of hay that you're feeding on a Friday. It doesn't go along and change. It's not really practical, you can do it. It's not really practical to carry out forage analysis at the farm level on a pasture. We can do this at research level, we can do this at uh, university level, and it's done at university levels, but not really practical. And the reason why it's not really practical is because of this time problem. You go along and you take a forage analysis, you send it off to the lab to be tested, it takes a number of days for that test analysis to come back. By the time it comes back, the, the, the forage has changed. It's not the same as the one you sent off. So it's not really very practical. So as a result, your daily dietary nutrient intake then becomes variable, which means that your performance outcomes are not constant over the grazing season. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. And we kind of, when I go through this, we kind of show you how you can get around this issue. It's difficult to correct and adjust for different performance outcomes in season. So if you're looking for, if in the middle of the year, you want to suddenly go along and get an improvement in performance, that's really difficult to go along and to do because you simply can't make a change to your forage. It's stuck in whatever it is. However, we can make an estimate of likely performance then through modeling. And if we model this, we get an idea as to how, what our pasture is likely to do. Not that it, it actually does it, it's what it likely goes along and does. 
So this is essentially the model that we actually use. So this is a model that was developed by Jovan and, and, and associates back in and, and his companions back in 2008. So you can read this performance model either from the bottom up or the top down. You can start and say, this is the performance I want, and you can read it downwards, or you can read it from the bottom upwards. And I like to read it essentially from the bottom up. So I start essentially with, I walk into the field and my pasture contains components that are digestible. That's a certain number. They've got certain structural components and there's the standing bio biomass there. And that has an in, all of these structural components and the amount that's there has an impact then on the, on the uh, intake. And the intake then of course then affects then uh, what the performance of that animal is likely to be. So all of these are interlinked. So I show here two pictures here. And so the performance of the cattle in the particular pasture here is going to be very different uh, weight for weight than say the sheep that are down here being grazed on this particular clover because a two different types of actual forages, but also very different in terms of the, the amount of forage in front of these animals. And we'll come to this when we talk about our um, standing biomass, which has a big impact. So how does our model work? And in the picture here is uh, my summer student from last year, Isabella Princep. So we were involved in developing this particular model. It was very much in draft form. We're gonna do more work on that this coming year. But how the model essentially works is that you go into your field and you determine the stage of growth condition of the pasture. So you're essentially using your eyeballs to go along and to say, okay, this is, the, the, this is, my, this is my pasture condition. From that, then you can estimate what your dry matter intake for the class of animal you want to talk about, whether you're talking about your dairy cows as in this particular picture, or whether we're talking about stalker animals or beef cows, whatever. Um, we get this from our NRC, our NRC and our, our, our INRA table. So this gives us an idea as to, based on the state of growth, and what we're seeing in the field, what the likely dry matter intake of these animals is likely to be. We then have to adjust our dry matter intake for the stage of growth, which has to do with a thing called a fill value. It's to do with how bulky that particular grass is. And from that, then we can calculate because we have a series of tables for different stages of growth for different grasses. And we can calculate then what the net energy of maintenance is, gain, lactation, pregnancy, so on and so forth for that particular grass growth stage. And from that then, using that number, we can determine then what the maintenance energy or energy of the lactation, we know from our NRC tables what the requirements are. And by combining what's being provided in the pasture from what um, is the animal's requirement, we can predict what the animal's likely performance is likely to be. So one of the things we have to do is we have to account for what's referred to as the grazing behavior or, or a grazing factor. And this is something that anybody who grazes animals is very familiar with, that cattle don't graze or sheep or um, don't graze uh, pastures uniformly, say, unlike a mowing machine. So animals, they, they graze in a hierarchy. So we're quite familiar with animals grazing in a hierarchy when we talk about animals grazing, say, grazing corn, for example, because what they do is the same behavior, but they're doing it obviously with a much shorter, shorter, shorter plant. So what they do is they preferentially select the best bits, leaving the undesirable parts behind. So they graze in a hierarchy, which means that they graze the, the, the very top leaves, first of all, of your grass plant, because that's where the greatest amount of energy is, and that's the most palatable leaf. Then they graze the secondary leaves, the leaves that have not decayed away, and then, and only then will they go along and they graze, uh, they graze the stems. And really, once the stem has uh, lignified, they don't graze it, they really just leave it, leave it, leave it behind. So the bigger the space you give animals, the choosier they become. So last night, uh, Joe Dickinson would have spoken about rotational grazing and how to get into rotational grazing. And this is the reason why we really talk about rotational grazing and the benefits of it, because if you give animals a lot of space, they become very, very choosy. And so they very nicely go along and pick the only the, only the good bits that they actually want, in which case they need a lot, a lot of space. The more space you give them, the choosier they become. The smaller the space is, the less choosier they, 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 they can be. So we measure this 
choosiness in a sense as a rate of utilization. So it's essentially measuring how much of the pasture that's when you start grazing, how much of the pasture do they graze down to? Typically five, six centimeters is kind of what we're looking at. They could graze down lower, they could graze down higher, but essentially we're looking as to how much of it is utilized. And what we want it to be is the higher the rate typically is the better. So what happens then is that from an animal behavior perspective, when you do that, and we talk about rotational grazing here, on a second rotation, when the animals come around to graze the area that they previously grazed before, what they'll do is because they've left some of this material behind, that material behind has continued to grow. So that material now is very mature. However, the area that they grazed really tight and they grazed down that say 30, 40, 50% of the area that they grazed down really tight, this area has now regrown. So that's their target. And they're gonna graze that again first. So that creates these islands that we often see in our pastures. And that's simply because if you see this grazing behavior, if you observe your animals doing that, then you'll see that. So the higher the utilization rate, as in the previous rotation, the bigger the area that is available for regrowth. And the bigger the area is available for regrowth, the better the performance. So one of the things I'm gonna mention over and over again tonight is that young pasture is higher in energy and therefore higher in performance. The older and mature the pasture becomes, and we see when I, when I show you the graphs, the lower the performance because it has less energy and less dry matter intake. So the more you can get them to utilize the pasture, the better you're going to go along and get your performance. But there's caveats that we have to go along and put into that. So if you, for example, are someone that likes the idea of, say, cutting your pasture after grazing, what you're essentially doing is you're pretending that you're getting 100% utilization. You're removing all the old material, the old, uh, the, the, the grasses that could get mature, you're removing them, and then you're making... Uh, the area underneath then, the, 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 getting 100% of the area then is regrowth. And that's what we've seen in that picture there with the little video. So there is an area that was cut and it has regrown. And when we did our model, our model basically accounted for this. So here is basically a picture. And again, I want to show, part of this is basically showing pastures. We had a pasture there in July where it was very, very, very overgrown, very, very, very mature. This is also in July, but this area is not overgrown and it's not very mature. And a reason why I show that doesn't really show up all that well, and I'm not sure my it will actually show up. If we were to walk this field, you'd see all these mounds here. Now, some of these mounds do correspond to cow pats that the animals themselves are essentially ignoring, and they don't want to graze those areas because they're too, they're too sour, essentially. But the areas between, they will continue to graze. So this is the area of regrowth, and this is the what they want to go along and target. And these younger animals are really after young, fresh regrowth. That's what, what they're actually doing. But again, the question is, if you see these animals, what I want you as a producer to be thinking about is, if these are my animals and this is my pasture, how fast are these animals growing? And do you have an idea? Could you estimate without weighing them? It's not practical to go along and do, you could do it, but it's not practical to bring in all these animals and weigh them. You wanna be able to go along and say, okay, this is my pasture, this is what it looks like. Here's a rough idea what I think they're actually doing. And whatever it is, then you can make an actual adjustment. Just to mention some things to come back to this idea, and I really kind of talk about pastures from the nutritional perspective, which is that animal performance, the main drivers of it really is dry matter intake, because in a pasture situation, it's variable and constantly changing. So we have to go along and take that into, into account. And our energy levels then are really important to consider as well too. They are typically low and they're also very variable. It's typical of all, of, of all forages, they're typically low. The other items, proteins, minerals, minerals and vitamins, they're pretty okay. Most of our pastures are mixed legume forages, uh, pastures anyways. And um, so that's not an, an issue. And in minerals and vitamins, we can correct for relatively easy by using our minerals and pasture. So just to continue a little bit on the kind of the science -y kind of stuff before we get into kind of the actual, uh, what, what do some things look like when we try and estimate their gains and this kind of stuff. Um, so really what we look at here is some quality parameters. So we know about the NDF. So this neutral detergent fiber is what we measure when we send our forages off to be sampled. Uh, the lab will sample for the NDF. What I want you to look really is at the bottom of these particular graphs. So this is 
pastures as you go from early spring through to late fall. And then we have one here that's got leafy regrowth after cutting. You will notice that the columns are gradually increasing, but the percentage dry matter is, is declining. And that's because there's an inverse effect here. As the, ND, as the NDF percentage increases, the dry matter intake declines. And that's simply because NDF is simply a measure of the bulkiness of the forage. It's the bulkiness of that fiber, the rate at which it, it digests. The slower it digests, the more that remains in the, in the rumen, the less space there is then available for new feed to be taken into that particular rumen. Correspondingly as well to uh, another one of the tests that's typically done on forages is to look at the ADF percentage. This again is looking at what is the, is, it's really a measure of, it's a way to go along and to measure energy intake. It itself is not directly related to energy. We have to use a series of equations to come up with that actual particular relationship. But uh, what essentially it tells us is that as pastures again mature, the percentage of ADF increases. As the percentage of ADF increases, the energy in that particular pasture or that forage declines. So you can see here in both of these particular ones, we see that as you go from the early spring, that lush of grass that we find in April, May and early June, we find that uh, our dry matter intake and our energy levels are pretty high. But as we progress through heading and flowering and get into that post-flowering stage, late July, kind of July into early August side of that house, dry matter intake can be significantly reduced because that pasture can be very, very mature and equally so then on the energy side. So this ends up being kind of a double whammy also that as pastures mature, your dry matter intake declines, but also what they're actually eating is lower in energy. So you have two effects going on. The amount they can eat goes down and the energy in what they are actually able to eat is also lower. And that ultimately results then in lower performance. So we'll take a look at some examples that are here. Just a little bit on dry matter intake at pasture. It's voluntary and it's selective. I mentioned that already. So this, when you, unlike in a confinement situation, put animals into a confinement situation, you decide as the producer how much they're going to go along to eat. So you give animals a TMR, they can't go along and separate it out. So they just have to eat whatever they're actually given. In a pasture, it's a different situation. They are in control of what they go along and they eat. So they, it's and it's voluntary and it's selective, as I also mentioned. So some of the determining factors are the animal characteristics, which really relates to the size of the animal. So here we have a heifers and uh, two heifers and a, and, a, and, a, and a bull here, two different sized animals. Consequently, they're going to have two different dry matter intakes is also the issue of the forage characteristics. It just comes back to our NDF and our ADF. So as pastures mature, the NDF goes up. Therefore, the forage characteristics, which affect this thing called fill value, which is the bulkiness of this of the forage in the rumen, uh, increases, which reduces down dry matter intake. And in order to determine performance, we have to know certain things. So we need to know what the net energy of intake is, and that's determined by what our dry matter intake is, and what is the net energy uh, of that particular forage. And this is just looking here at seasonal changes in dry matter intake. We see again from the leafy stage, um, this is looking at dry matter intake is pretty high. So it's a value of, of 1.2 that's here. It declines significantly down then to 0 0.8. So we see as we go from the leafy stage through to the flowering stage, that our dry matter intake is declining. And then once we get back into the fall and we get our summer, I get our fall regrowth, then you get this, it bumps back up again. So this is kind of what you have to, have to account for when we're thinking about the performance of animals. The other thing we have to think about then is what's called the effect of standing biomass. So this really, basically all this essentially says is that the more biomass or the more kilograms of dry matter per hectare that you have in a field, or kilograms pounds of dry matter per acre that you have in a field, the greater the dry matter intake is, up to a point, beyond which you don't get any improvement in dry matter intake. And the kind of guiding figure that has traditionally been used for most, uh, and definitely for forages uh, in Western Canada, we would in, in, sorry, in Eastern Canada, we typically would use 
is um, something between two and a half thousand and three thousand kilograms of dry matter per hectare is kind of the point where once you go beyond that, you're not getting any increase in dry matter intake. And in fact, what you end up then is a lot of that pasture then gets um, kind of gets knocked over and not consumed. And um, the, the other thing to bear in mind when we think about the limitations of intake is that as we go from 500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare as shown in the bottom of this graph to 3000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare as shown here, that's time because it takes time from a pasture that will be starting at 500 to go to 3000. And if that's time, that equals maturity. And so it's finding the sweet spot along that curve to know where you should go along and actually introduce or where you should go along and start feeding your animals. So this work was done back in 1997 by Buchanan Smith. So Jock Buchanan Smith and his colleagues did a research project back in 1987, and they looked at uh, what was the effect of pasture height on pasture quality. So they did a series of tests, they measured the ADF percentage, and from that then we can work out what the net energy is and what the likely expected gain is based on that particular uh, reserve rent, that particular uh, research project. And their conclusion from that came from that particular project, and this is directly quoted from the paper that Jock Buchanan Smith wrote, was that the nutrition and quality of a rotationally grazed grass legume pasture can be optimized by entering the pasture at or about or less than 20 centimeters. And that pretty much agrees with this particular graph that uh, again from Jovan in in from Ed, in, in Enra did. It basically says that if you look at 20 centimeters, as in the Jock Buchanan Smith work, you look at the work that uh, Dr. Kim Schneider and Courtney Higgins did when they examined what was the pasture density of about 165 kilograms of dry matter per centimeter. If you multiply that out, it comes in at around 2,500 to 3,000 kilograms of dry matter occurs at around that 20 centimeter mark, which is what, and this, this work says that once you go beyond about 20 centimeters or 25 centimeters, you essentially hit a situation where there's no more intake. So, and so that pretty much agrees. So if we're thinking about estimating our, our, our pasture performance, um, we have to do a number of things. We have to work out what our dry matter intake is per day. We then have to check and see what is the, does it satisfy the maintenance requirements? So how many pounds of pasture they must be dedicated to maintenance? We calculate then the net energy of intake and then the, the final step, and we look at animals here that are grazing these uh, background animals that are, that are here, we will see what energy is available, if any, for gain in this particular situation. So I'm gonna take an example. I just used this previous picture here that we had. So it would be estimated based on the data that we have that this particular type of pasture would probably be doing around 2% of body weight. So I use 770 pound background and say, why did you pick such an odd number? It's because 770 pounds is 350 kilos, which nicely and neatly ties in with the tables that we have in the uh, NRC. So we know that the net energy required from the NRC for a 770 pound animal is about 6.2 megacals per day. Um, we know that the net energy supplied by this particular uh, pasture, and we can get these uh, we can calculate this, we can tabulate this from the INRA data is about 1.92 megacals per kilogram. So it means that our maintenance, to meet maintenance, these animals need to consume 3.64 kgs or 3.3. And therefore, if they're eating seven kilos, there's 3.3 kilos available for gain. We kind of roughly work out what the net energy for gain is. And uh, it comes at about... So from the NRC table, we can estimate that on our spring pasture, you could expect animals will be above two pounds, maybe around that 2.3, 2.4 pounds per head per day. That's kind of the gain what you would have there. Now, if we move forward and we take this type of a pasture, so this is in late July, and we know that in late July, uh, the dry matter intake, which in the previous one was seven kilos, we know that it declines because it's the grass is more mature. If the grass is more mature, we know if it takes up more space in the animal, therefore the dry matter intake is lower. The energy content 
therefore, the net energy, the maintenance requirement of the almond doesn't change, but the uh, amount of pasture needed to supply the maintenance has gone up. So we need to have four and a half, four, just over four kilos. And that means that we only have 0.98 kilos available for gain. So we know that the net energy for gain in this particular, because it's different, it's older, it's more mature, it's lower. And because it's lower from the NRC table, we can estimate that animals grazing this probably would do around half a pound a day, which is a big difference than what we see on our spring pasture. What if we went in and we cut our grass? What would happen in that case? So we didn't let it go to this stage. We grazed this off. Maybe we take a second rotation because it was pretty good when it came back and then we came along and we cut it. So because it's regrowth, it's many ways, it's sort of like spring grazing. It's not, but it's kind of similar. There's a lot, it's very much in the vegetative state. There's no stems. So the energy requirement in this case then is that to meet maintenance, we need 3.67 kilos. So we're looking at around 1.8 pounds per head per day is kind of what you can extrapolate from that information by simply looking at the pasture itself. You can say, okay, I can estimate what that actually kind of works out at. So this is really a graph here, which shows how our how our gains, and I'm using here my background around this because they're the easiest to go along and talk about here. What happens over the year as we go from early spring grazing right through to fall growth in say, so we're running from May through to October. So we will see that, so at 50% utilization, it simply means that we put our animals into our pasture and we graze it and we're grazing with, they're removing half and they're leaving half behind. And so we come back in a second rotation, then they're going to graze the 50% that they grazed previous. And they may not graze at all, but they'll graze some of the stuff that was that's a little bit more mature. So as we go through the year, uh, you see that our average daily gain declines. So it goes from early spring grazing through to flowering in like, like July time of the year. We get into kind of stemmy regrowth. We're in and around just under a pound, kind of where we are at that particular. But once we get into fall, then growth pops back up again. So we could expect our gains to recover once we get more into the fall and we get that fall regrowth. And many people have argued that fall regrowth is as good, if not better than spring regrowth. The truth is it's not. It's not as strong. It doesn't have the same impact. But um, if we take our 770 pound animal here, Probably we can predict if you use this equation or use this um, progression throughout the year and it simply say if they're growing at two pounds per day and I graze them in spring grazing for 10 days, so it's two pounds per day by 10 equals 20 and so on and so forth. Over the course of the grazing season, we get a gain of about 225 pounds in this case. We would expect average daily gains to be about 1.5 pounds, which would give us an end weight of about 995 pounds in this scenario. What happened if we really wanted to be more intensive in our grazing? We upped our, our, our utilization rate. We grazed down our pasture a lot tighter. We went to 65%. Well, what that does essentially is that it pushes up our gains because the 65% that was grazed tight in the first rotation is the area that they graze again. And that area of regrowth is larger. And since the area of regrowth is larger then the animal performance is better. So you see this increase. So we get overall, we go from our 225 that we had in our 50% rate up to 237, but may not be a huge difference, but if you multiply that out over a herd of animals, that can be quite significant. What if we were a little bit more, we were pretty poor in the way we managed our pasture and we just didn't do a whole lot and we kind of got around 30% utilization rate. Well, in this case, then, rather than getting a thousand pounds at the end, we're down to 979. So we're getting very poor performances then in and over the summer period. So in this period from late June through to early August is where we're kind of struggling to get over. And we're just a little bit over half a pound is where we're kind of sitting at before we get into fall. And then things kind of pop up and get going again. What if we went along and cut? Well, if we went along and we were aggressive with our cutting, we would probably be able to go along and to prevent, you notice the, 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 the graph continues its decline down to its stemmy regrowth if we intervened. 
And we said, okay, I'm going to go along and cut my pasture after, say, heading. I'm not going to cut it till then because my performance is a decent up until then. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to go leafy regrowth after cutting. And then you see the performance is much, much higher. And so we're getting up an end weight. That's a lot better. We will just do this cutting um, to cover really the summer period. So we're kind of trying to keep our pasture in its uh, vegetative state for as long as for as long as possible. But ultimately, we're coming up with an end weight. We're estimating what it um, what it actually looks like. So in the case, let's say we take an example here again. Let's go back to our sixty five percent utilization rate person, and they say, okay. I'm going to go along and I really don't want to be grazing this uh, over this very mature pasture in July and early August. I'm actually going to go along and put them onto some, I grew some oats. I planted some, or I grew some uh, uh, winter cereal. I grew it in the spring. So I don't have to worry about, um, I don't have to worry about uh, it, it seeding out or anything like that. It's going to be very, very vegetative. So you see a big pop in performance when you go along and do that, because you're seeing that the animals, this stuff is much, much more energetic. It's much, much more digestible. So you see a big an increase in actual performance there. As a matter of interest, when you take a look at um, our younger animals, um, we often graze Sardom Sudan grass. Well, when you put in Sardom Sudan grass, even when you've got relatively high utilization rates on your pasture, it's not a whole lot different. We kind of know that younger animals don't do as well on Sargon Sudan grass. Sargon Sudan is a really good, um, it's a really good, it's a really good warm season grass to grow if you want to go along and to uh, graze for, raise your uh, beef cows. It's a really good way to go along and to do it, but it doesn't do a whole lot when we're talking about the younger animals because its digestibility and so on is, is a little bit lower than what you would expect. It's better, they're better off grazing oats or other types of um, small grain, small grain cereal. So that was kind of looking a little bit at our um, at our our stalker animals, but what about our beef cow? Because they're very different. So they have different requirements to our growing animals. So we need to do, particularly over the grazing season, for most producers, we're looking at providing for maintenance, lactation, and really providing for early pregnancy. Although the amount of energy she directs for early pregnancy is pretty well irrelevant. So we know that the, uh, the energy requirement per unit of weight is really lower versus growing animals. She's got a bigger room and can take in uh, a lot more of her diet. Um, she has a larger intake. So, so this really is just looking at our nutrient requirement for, 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 for beef cows. And I'm just gonna jump on to our slide here, which um, if we look at here, so you notice a big difference between, so rather than putting it in as what's our average date again, because you can't really use that with, with our beef cows. What this really basically shows is what is the energy required and how does that compare to the energy supplied? So we see here in early spring that even at just a basic standard 50% utilization rate, we're looking more or less at uh, energy. Energy in the early spring is definitely in excess of what the animal needs, which is good because normally these are cows that have just calved. It's a good opportunity for them to regain their body condition and get milking and get back in calf. And we see a little bit of a dip here then in the summertime, which you would basically expect, but it's not significant. And then obviously you get back into the fall and again, we get an improvement. We see our energy levels are a little bit higher than our uh, requirements are. 30% utilization rate is a little bit lower here. Um, we would probably go along and see in this situation here on that if they're grazing this type of material, then this type of, 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 of forages, you would probably go along and see uh, a little bit of weight loss there, maybe a reduction in milk supply uh, the milk supply wouldn't really come back in the fall, but our body condition score definitely would. And if we had 65%, so we're pretty aggressive in our, in our pasture management, we're really keeping it um, grazed well, and we have a lot of like good regrowth coming back. Uh, in that case, then we really are helping to go along and keep our energy required. Our energy supply and energy required are very even really throughout the year. And there's not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of difference there between those ones. So um, I do have a few pictures here before we move on to questions. So thinking about what we've actually said, I just want to kind of put it out there to say, do you want to kind of try and guess? I do have the answers here. 
what do we think the animal performance would be? Now, some of you have had the opportunity to visit the um, Elora Beef Research Farm. This is where this particular picture was taken. This is was taken in uh, early May. So if we think of our background ring animals, um, if we put our stalkers out onto this particular type of pasture, what kind of performance do you think you would get? Or if you went along and you took your beef cows and this was the type of pasture you were grazing, what kind of performance would you typically think you would you would, you would get? So I'll just give you the answer there. If you put it into the model, and the model would kind of suggest, and again, it's only a model. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not accurate. It it's the best guess we can actually make. So our stalker cattle would you would expect that animals that are grazing this type of pasture would probably do between two, two and a quarter, maybe they do two and a half pounds per head per day. This is very, very, very digestible. 90% of this can be grazed because it's very, 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 it's in the vegetative state, very high in energy, and that energy is very, very digestible. For our beef cows, this is really good pasture for putting our beef cows onto. You might argue the point and say that it's actually a little bit too good for them, but depending on how well they've calved down, they will definitely gain weight you will definitely get good milk make and milk production from these animals if they're grazing this type of an actual pasture. So if we go here into and we look at our animal performance, I mean, you've seen this picture earlier, earlier on, um, what kind of um, what kind of performance would you expect if you walked into this field and said to yourself, I'm going to put my animals in here. I'm going to put my, I've got some, uh, 780 pound uh, calves there, and I'm going to pop them into this field here. How fast do you think they're going to grow? And I don't know. And pictures are sometimes hard to go along and tell. It's actually better to be there because you get a far better, better idea. But this is very headed out. There's a lot of stem here. So how do you think, what do you think your stocker cattle would do? What do you think your beef cows would do? So this is Part of what I want to do here tonight is really to get people to, when they walk in their pastures, to think about their pastures and say, how, how good is this at driving performance on my, on my farm? What is, is it going to meet the requirements that I have? So in this case, we could probably estimate by modeling it and being a little bit kind of going through it and seeing, well, maybe it was grazed before, maybe it hasn't been grazed, kind of would expect 0.5 to a pound per day is probably where you're going to go along and land. So if you think about your grazing performance, we think about if this was your field and in the spring, you put them out in the month of May and they were doing this, and let's say you didn't come back until it looked like this. Well, you're, you cannot expect this to perform exactly the same. So what you get then is a lot less performance. And so you end up with less milk, Probably you would, maybe depending on how much undergrowth there is there, maybe they would not lose weight. They may lose weight depending on um, what I would have to hazard to guess by looking at this picture. I'm familiar with, I took this picture that they would probably lose weight in this particular field. So this is our regrowth. You've seen that little video that was there. This is our regrowth. And this is 90% of this is orchard grass. And uh, there's a lot of orchard grass in this. And uh, this was July regrowth after cutting. It's, I mean, it's it's really good, good, good quality pasture. Again, if you had your animals grazing on this type of a pasture, what would you expect? And you're reasonably, so it's not so far off what you would get in the spring, but in and around that kind of 1.8, maybe, maybe depending on the weight of the animal, maybe a bit less, but maybe a little bit more you're really going to get a lot of really good performance out of that particular pasture. And on the beef cow side of the house, you're definitely going to go along and see weight gain. You're going to see good milk production. Going back to the, on the dairy side, you definitely would not want to put your dairy cows into this. Uh, they would lose milk significantly if they graze a lot of this stuff. They will do very well on this. They will do very well on this, but they won't do very well on that. That's just the reality on the, on the, on the ground. So, um, and just to mention, uh, some of the work we have done is that one of the things we are doing, and my summer student will be working on this too. So this last year was a, um, 
a, a, a guide that we were going to create for our producers to go along. And so they could look at their pasture conditions and then this would be a quick reference guide for a producer to go along and say, and we were starting off with um, producers that are backgrounding their animals to go along and say, okay, if my animals are at this weight, this is the pasture condition that I'm observing, what do I expect? How fast are those animals likely to be growing? Uh, the numbers here need to be adjusted. They were just thrown in here. They're roughly speaking, they're not, they're not anyways accurate or anything like that. There's a lot more work to be done on this to make it more uh, reflective of reality on the ground. And um, so that's kind of what we're working on, on this year. We hope to go along to do that for both backgrounding animals. We hope to do this type of thing, looking at our fall weaned calves because they're in the same situation when they come off their cows and they go on to pasture, then the question becomes, should you creep free, should you not, so on and so forth. Again, it's all about knowing the pasture you're putting your animals into so that you could estimate what they're going to do. If you can estimate what they're going to do, then you can decide, do I need to feed them supplementary feed? And if so, how much? You can work that kind of thing and thing, thing out without having to go to the issue of actually weighing them to figure that particular thing or the thing out. And also the biggest ones, so the main people that are really affected by pasture conditions on the beef side are those, those uh, animals being backgrounded on pasture. And when we talk about people that are involved in, um, when we talk about people involved in um, uh, grass-fed beef and so on, where you want to try and get as much performance out of their pasture and out of your forages in order to put weight on those particular animals. And I just want to go along and finish up here. I do want to mention that the uh, Canadian cow-calf survey is underway. Um, the deadline for participating is uh, March 31st. And uh, you can check this out at beefresearch.ca. This has been done nationwide. And uh, we would like to see uh, more Ontario producers participate. Uh, you can either go to the beefresearch.ca uh, forward slash survey, or you can use a QR code that you see here on screen. Okay, so I think with that, I'm going to take a few pictures. So thank you for indulging me this evening. So I'll hand thanks, you back to thanks. Bridget. Ask Actually, no, James, I'm the one who gets to field questions okay, for you. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. And uh, the first question we have is, um, you showed some energy requirements for beef cows. And okay, back here. I'm going to grab are, it so you can see it. Yes. Well, no, are are those specific to like calving in March and weaning in November? Or yes. are those flexible if you have a different system? Uh, the nutrient requirements remain the same. It doesn't matter when you're actually calving. This is the nutrient requirement of the animal. So uh, what I'm showing here is a typical spring calving, calving in, in, calving in, 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 in May, and weaning those animals in and um, weaning their calves in 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 um, October. So, but it, the nutrient requirement of the beef cow herself doesn't go along and change. Whatever time of the year she's 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 calving down, her requirements for maintenance, lactation, and pregnancy remain the same. The only difference is that if you are calving down in the fall, your pregnancy requirements are going to be a lot higher and your lactation is going to be lower because by the time we get to, because if you're calving in the fall, then the late pregnancy, that second trimester and third trimester are going to be over the summer grazing period. So her maintenance requirement remains the same. Her lactation is going to be a little bit on the lower side, but her pregnancy requirements are going to be higher. And I don't have that particular one uh, available to show here. It's going to be the total in-cows per day are going to be higher than what I'm showing you here. Uh, the total in cows per day, top of my head, uh, I'm going to say it's about 16 mega cows per head per day is around that. So we're showing 12 here. It's about 16. Okay. Um, you talked about using mowing as one way to increase utilization. So yes. what, what should be the target height if producers decide to mow a pasture? Well, 
it's hard to give a exact uh, figure as to what the exact mowing height should should be. I mean, we typically go along on the grazing context. I mean, we typically we like we if we can get animals to graze down to five, six, seven centimeters, that's kind of where you're actually looking at. So if you're mowing down to that particular level, that's where you're kind of should be should be kind of aiming, aiming, aiming for. OK, and could you give some milk production performance outcomes or just make a comment on maybe how um this idea might apply differently to dairy if it, if it oh, is oh to dairy okay yeah so i was going to mention a little bit on the dairy side so i'm going to go back here to my picture uh let me grab uh da, 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 let me see which picture is a good example i, I shall go back here and i hope people don't get pain their head with this moving okay if we go back to our picture. So this is our spring grazing pasture that, that that's here. So um, typically on the on the organic dairy side, we're looking at about 30% of our uh, dry matter intake is going to come from uh, our pasture. So the, the issue on the dairy side is that typically dairy producers are going to be working with a nutritionist. Now, I'm, I'm thinking about the organic dairy. First of all, I'm not sure if this question is from an organic dairy or they're from the grass-fed dairy person. But um, on the organic dairy side, you will be doing uh, a TMR, uh, I assume if you have a robot, maybe you'll be doing a PMR as well as a, and you, and, but you have to, when you're doing this thing, you have to go along and take into account the, 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 the energy content that's going to be in this pasture. So for dairy cattle, you want to be grazing it at its highest energy level possible. So that means that you have to keep your pasture in the vegetative state for as long as possible. And from a utilization perspective, we we want to be 80% plus. So you're going to have to graze really tight. This is why in particularly in Western Europe and in New Zealand and so on, they use strip grazing as a method to go along and to do that because you have to make certain sure that you're maximizing your the amount of dry matter the animals are eating from your pasture, but also more importantly, the energy intake that's coming from that pasture so that you're able to go along to drive milk, 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 milk production um can you repeat the question again christine can you Fisher, give some milk production performance outcomes basically or, or oh, we've we've got kind of a clarification question what kind yes. of milk production is possible on grass alone assuming a very high utilization rate i would have to run the figures on that particular one, I'm it'd be difficult to go along and to comment straight off because it would really depend on there's a there's a lot of factors involved here, and I would have to run it in the in the model to go along and to tell you exactly what it what it what it would be. Yeah, that that gets complicated. Like I know, yes, uh, from looking at grass based dairies in like Ireland or New Zealand, you know they're they're feeding a little bit of vitamin and mineral and protein in in the parlor, and they're getting you know, 7,000 liters, 9,000 liters a year, but they're also using very different cows. They're much smaller yes, body size. Yeah. They're much and they're different also, genetics. Yeah, but so they're also, there's a, there, there is the thing of where you, you it's, it's a little bit different because what you're doing with the dairy cow is you're, you're starting with what do I want my milk yield to be? And then you work mm -hmm. back from that and you say, okay, I want to, I want to get 20 kilos of milk per head per day. If you start from that level, then you work backwards from that as to what is the feed that's going to deliver that. And in the New Zealand situation and in the situation in the British Isles is that they will get, they, they know the energy content and it's easier to manage it in the, in those in those countries because they have one species. They only have pretty and ryegrass. So it's like as if everybody here was grazing oats all the whole time and nothing else. Well, then in that case, then you wouldn't have to worry so much about working out well, what is my pasture condition because it's always going to be and it also it's very slow growing in those countries so it's all it, it the grass is naturally uh not heading out as quick as it does here but you start from the process of working out how much what's the killings of dry matter what's the killings of milk i need and then you say how much is this how much how much how many kilos will my grass deliver and that depends on the grass and it depends on your grass mix and so on and then you said if i'm short how much grain do I have to feed in order to bring me up to that level? Okay, and that's what happens in you. New Zealand and in the British Isles scenario is that the dairy farmers will feed grain in the parlor as a way to go along and to make, to get there. Now they have to consider economics, but there's a, there is a, there is a, a sweet spot. 
All right, and we have time for one more question. Uh, so what effect, if any, will a higher utilization rate have on the rest period? Have on the rest period is mm -hmm. that it may be a little longer than what you would be typically having. Okay. So if you are, that's essentially what you would have. So the, the, the rest period becomes longer because the area, because the area you have grazed, you've grazed more of the area. So now you have, you need more time for it to grow back to the, the level you want to start grazing at. Okay. Thank you so much, James. I'm going to turn things over now to Birgit to uh, offer some final comments. Great, thank you. Excellent presentation, James. Um, a lot of detail there and a lot to get our heads wrapped around. I really appreciate it. Thank you again to our sponsors, Beef Farmers of Ontario and the Farm Resilience Mentorship Program. And thank you again for everyone for participating this evening.